Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. Today, we're extremely lucky to be joined by Dale Stevenson. Dale, can you give us a little bit of a background about who you are and what you do? I can. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Dale Robert Stevenson. Um, I like that you put in the Robert there. Put in the Robert there, yeah. Uh, t- tell the full story. Uh, look. What's the best way to bridge this? Uh, we'll start from the start. You were an athlete to start with. In a previous life, like yourself, was an athlete. You were a much um, better athlete than I was. Well, we'll leave the judgment out of it, but uh, we competed in a similar era. And then I went away from competitive sport for a while. For context, um, he's being very modest. You made the 2012 Olympics in the shop put for Australia. I did. I did. And then I you moved into put a relatively rugby. early full stop on my athletics career. Do you, want to, um, do you want to give a bit of background to that? Because for our listeners who do know you a little bit, and we obviously have a lot of people in the track and field world, they may not know why you stepped away because you made the Olympic team. And then was it basically straight after that? that, that the you Olympics made- was my last competitive uh, meet uh as a as an athlete yeah and and then you you actually transitioned to an, into another sport i did i did i moved across uh i had i moved across to rugby union i had no uh plans to do that when i retired from athletics so i retired from athletics and then space opened up and uh that was a, an avenue that i ended up going down uh it's an important sort of, but it's an important nuance to me. I didn't retire from athletics to, to pursue something else. I retired from athletics at the age of 24 uh, after making my first Olympic team and only Olympic team. I never made a world champs. I did make a world indoors team and did a Commonwealth Com Games well? team. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, picked up a, a bronze at Com Games back in 2010, salubrious surroundings of Delhi. Yeah, it was um, an interesting game. Though. It was an interesting one. But, yeah, honestly, it feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, I stand by that decision. I have seen many people uh, involved in the sport that you and I love, uh, athletics, uh, end up disillusioned or disenfranchised with the sport, largely from probably trying to milk more from it than maybe what it is. Well, we we can get into that at some point because I had this discussion with, with someone at the holding camp in Montpellier, and they probably didn't agree with me, but mm. we'll get onto it. We'll at come some back point. to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look. It was time. Um, I I feel like I was reaching the ceiling of my genetic potential um, and potentially reached it. Uh, my my body was hurting as a result of that. Uh, I was trying to square peg, round hole kind of stuff, and uh, it was taking a lot of energy to overcome the inertia that was pulling me in another direction. Mm-hmm. And I thought this is an appropriate time to uh, put a full stop on on my athletic pursuits with it while I still got a smile on my face and happy memories. And I'm glad I did because coming full circle, I've ended up back in the sport on the other side of the fence. And um, perhaps uh, if I tried to squeeze more out of it, uh, of my own selfish pursuits as an athlete, I I may not be as passionate as I, I am now. You ended up, as you said, going into rugby union. What made that transition and, and what actually was the prompt for that? Because as you said, it wasn't actually your background. I know you played a fair bit of AFL growing up. Yeah, well, being born and raised in, in Melbourne, um, going through school and mates and, well, about an hour and a half outside of, of down the Melbourne, down the Mornington yeah. Peninsula. Yeah, you really don't have too many options. It's it's surfing and AFL and, uh, and shop wood. And, and, yeah, shop wood for those of us who um, maybe don't fit into either of those categories, but... I guess from a from a physiological perspective, I wasn't particularly well suited uh, to playing AFL after a certain, uh, probably under 15, 16s or so, middle of high school, I became quite apparent that the game was increasingly aerobic and um, I was not put on this earth to, to I wasn't dealt those cards. Um, the other relevant bit of information there is that when I was in, late primary school so going way back here 90s um my parents my family and i moved to the uk for 18 months as part of a secondment for my parents work uh and i picked up rugby over there so it started yeah, so it was a bit of a background i did ha- i had played uh and really loved the game uh fell in love with it there 
got exposure to it, partly because I could be good at it. Um, with the speed power background. Yeah, speed power background. There were positions that I could play that could contribute to the team um, in a positive way. I really enjoyed the contact element of it and uh, there's something about team sports that uh, is resonant. And when the space opened up, I decided I, I'd get back and started playing club rugby, uh, keep myself fit, didn't have any kids at the time, um, build some space outside of my, my profession, which was teaching. And then I kind of probably by virtue of being in an individual in an individual sport, there's a perfectionist tendency. You like to do things well. So I liked training and I didn't went from wanting to play rugby to keep fit to wanting to play rugby to get better to then you start to get opportunities open up and representative rugby and ended up playing semi professionally for a few years. It's a perfect prompt for something that I wanted to talk to you about, which is in these explosive sports or even explosive positions, how much of it do you think comes down to having that background physiologically of being very explosive, being a shot putter, and how much of it comes down to some of the technical aspects of the sport, you know, biomechanical features, technical features? Because you obviously were able to make that transition to a pretty high level. And now we'll get onto your coaching a little bit further because you've obviously had a lot of success with that. At international level as an, a throws coach but how do you see that game like when someone comes along and you're like okay i see they've got some of the features what's the, the puzzle that you're putting together to try and you know work that out because i think that a lot of the time in certain aspects people believe that they can build some of the physiological features to make up for some of the technical uh incapability of people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and vice versa you know, there's people who move really well, they've got all the skills, but they actually just don't have the grunt and they don't have the, the motor to do the job. For sure. Yeah. I mean, we're, if we're talking the context of track and field, and I think this does stack up across the whole sport well, of tell, track yeah, tell, and field, but I'll yeah, speak tell, specifically yeah. to um, my sort of pet domain of, of throws, is that you are you're trying to solve two concurrent problems mm. at any given time. There's, there is a capacity problem uh, and you can't escape that. And there is an efficiency problem and you can't escape that either. And that would apply whether you're sprinting, uh, pole vaulting. Uh, there is a difference in the balance of those two variables when you even look across men's throws versus women's throws. They are determined slightly differently, but according to the same well, variables of capacity and efficiency. How do you see that you know, changing between the sexes? Yeah. Okay, so if we were to line it up along a spectrum, so we've got in, in the throws events, we've got a uh, shot put, discus, hammer throw, and javelin. And the as a general rule of thumb, a javelin's a little bit different, but there's a general rule of thumb that the men's implements are twice the mass of the women's implements. And so if we refer back to our capacity efficiency variables, you are trying to solve uh a much more skill-based, so an efficiency-based problem in the hammer throw. It's much more forgiving according to different capacities. Yes. Uh, you can solve that problem to throw the implement X distance uh, in a number of different ways according to that efficiency variable. For and something that's, that's like both men and women? Both men and women. Yeah. Even more so, men. Okay. Men's, men's throws are more skill-based is my premise and I'll stand by that. Oh, we'll get to that because, well, actually we can get onto it now. Do you think that that's because the physical parameters are relatively even or once you reach a, say, certain capacity, which most of the elite athletes have reached, beyond that it becomes the efficiency problem? Correct, yes. You need a minimum threshold of, of capacity and if you look at the top guys in the world, and I say top not as in the guys who are at the Olympics, but the guys who are in the Olympic final, for example, so we're talking the top eight to ten athletes uh, in men's throws, they are all – they're incredibly powerful guys. Mm. Um, they would stack up in any context around the world, in any team sport around the world. You put them in a gym setting or well, – You saw that when you, you, know, you did that when you went across to the rugby. I remember there was for sure. news articles and things about how you were kind of pushing them pretty hard in the gym yeah. to elevate their level because you felt that some of the guys with their physical structure and their you know their background could and should do more yeah yeah could be actually pushing those numbers a bit yeah i think that that is particularly prevalent uh in male events 
women's events, uh, and I'll, I'll say women's events plus javelin in in our world, are a bit more. Firstly, they're a bit more genetically determined, and they're more capacity driven. I.e., you can tell a really good javelin thrower because they can throw really far at a young age. Yes. Okay. And you can then polish that and take time, probably a bit more akin to a 100-metre sprinter, right? Well, it's, it's funny. Other than maybe the 100 metres itself, like, you know, and I've had more success with female athletes, but I almost sometimes get a bit frustrated with female athletes, and this isn't a criticism of those, those athletes, but it's like the more physically, you know, uh, domineering kind of females, tall, long legs, they just dominate. Mm. And I look at them like, okay, it's almost cheating. Mm. You know, they've been given, as you said, it's genetically sure. determined. You've been dealt those cards. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, you see it across, you know, like sprint events, but, it, you know, 200 and 400, it's like the short athletes don't have almost any chance. Mm. Um, they just get chewed up. Mm. And it's a really interesting game. It is an interesting game, but it's also uh, when, you res- when you strip back the, the judgment or virtue from it. Mm. it Athlete X didn't choose to be born that no, way. No. Athlete Y didn't choose to be born that way. And I've been quite upfront with the athletes that I work with directly now around pointing that out to them, good, bad, or otherwise. Always. And I would, would say to you know Matt Denny, who um, just had success at, yeah, in bronze Paris medalist. Olympics, yep. just because you are born, you're six foot five, you've got six foot 11 wingspan, you didn't choose that. No. And that gives you, you every have- right to be a fantastic discus thrower and we – celebrate we need to celebrate that and we need to push that to be what it can be for you which is greater than what it could be for your eye and that's almost a mandate and a challenge to amplify your gifts but it doesn't give you the right to give life advice or to tell me about how hard you're working or whatever because a six foot 11 wingspan goes a hell of a lot further than a five foot 11 wingspan when you're talking about the task of throwing a discus so just delineating and, and pulling apart um the good bad narrative to a I, bit I love more that of you a, say that you know I love that you say that do you, do you know the philosopher Martin Heidegger I do he's got the concept of thrownness he does and I bring it up all the time with my athletes of like you know you don't get to choose you just get thrown into this life with yeah. whatever circumstances you get yeah and you have to be able to understand that that's your lot and, and, and even if that. you look back to you know Robert Sapolsky's stuff around behavioral evolution and and understanding that you know, a sociopath born a sociopath. Yes. And if they didn't end up in as either a CEO of a Fortune 500 or, or in jail yeah. at the age of 16, <laughs> you know, they didn't choose either of those paths. You no. didn't choose your parents and you didn't choose where you were born. So what, what degree of, without going, you know, what 10 minutes into a podcast, we're already on free will here. But um, <laughs> that, yeah, if we strip it back to the actual task of, of physical performance in a, in a sporting context, uh, that's, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. And you don't have to divulge personal conversations, but how does someone like Matt actually take that information on? Is he navigating that or is he sort of taking us a passing comment and moves on with his life? Um, no, look, I, he would be comfortable with me speaking with you openly about this and anyone else who listens to this being, being privy to it too now. Um, and now is probably a, a time to, we could open the book on it, maybe it, six months ago, less so, but. Um, Matt asked me to help him out. Uh, he'd been on the cusp of, he'd made multiple Olympic finals, uh, sorry, made Olympic final, world championship final. Yeah, he's finished fourth. Kind of finished fourth a couple times, of times, yeah. but hadn't cracked a podium. And, uh, and he was definitely capable of it and that was frustrating him. Um, and he asked for my, uh, counsel, guidance, um, a couple of years back. And that was one of the first things that I, in between the eyes with really mm. was um, from a loving place. Uh, you've got a bit of virtue signaling, you've got a bit of ego invol- involved in this and you've got a bit of um, a victim narrative that you've, that you've developed and passing out those two things of being like, hey, this is, you've got these gifts and you need to work to amplify them, but you need to strip away the woe is me stuff and you need to strip away the, any kind of belief that you work harder than anyone or you, you know, you're entitled to something because you're not, none of us are. Mm. And, and once we kind of flipped that one over and said, well, let's go about earning the right to 
amplify your gifts and, and show what you've got. To his credit, he took some time to navigate process that, that yeah. navigate that and, and took it on board and said, okay, uh, let's do it. And it's taken some time to rearrange some of those behaviours, but it's it started with really simple things like retrieving your own implements at training mm. like that. Um, going doesn't matter whether it's pissing down with rain or you know muddy and you've just got your new throwing shoes from your sponsor or whatever you trudge out there and pick up your own discs and no one does that for you and you, you hedge those standards around and um here's a question for you because it, sure. it it feeds into something that you know i alluded to in in some of the, the pre questions that i sent you what's that process like for you when you have someone that he's already at mm. what you would consider an extremely high level mm. But you have to take him now from, you know, good to great, mm. or you're trying to at least. Mm. What's that process like for you? Because it sounds like you obviously went through a, a, a bit of a uh, strategy of trying to work out what are the maybe limiting factors here. And one of them you obviously identified with some you know, belief structures. Is that always the approach you take or do you take different approaches in, in how you, you tackle that problem? Because... I assume it's at that level, at least, it's going to be a very individualized approach. Yeah, every project's a bespoke project and uh, it's an N of one um, at that level and it does get exponentially time-consuming <laughs> um, once you get towards those kind of pornier ends of the spectrum. But, yeah, look, I said this to, to Matt and to the other stakeholders involved at Did the time. Did you know him? Well beforehand, I did. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't say well uh, uh, enough. Of, yeah. Enough. Um, this is the first generation. We alluded to it earlier. I, I finished in 2012 competitively. This really is the first generation competing now, where none of them know who I was an athlete as an athlete, and none of my contemporaries and peers, maybe barring Catherine Mitchell, who <laughs> still keeps still on going in their yeah. mid 40s, um, making Olympic I, finals. I, making Olympic finals, are still competing. It, it, it's turned over and that actually makes it a lot easier um, from my perspective to come in as a, a third party and, and say, here's my professional opinion, um, take it or leave it. And that's a, I think it's a kind of noble and necessary place to work from if you want to do things. It's a place of honesty. It's a place of honesty. It's a, it's a better platform to start from. It is. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. Um, you asked me for Ask me for my counsel and and in service to the sport and in service to you know our country and and what we want to do is you know when you get the rare opportunity to to don the green and gold um, I did take that uh, task or that mandate fairly seriously to you know, measure twice cut once and and give him the feedback that he needed to hear not what he wanted to hear. Mm. You've actually had done this process a couple of times, from what I can tell, and then you can correct me if you, if that's not the case. But you've you've been tasked with athletes who are at a very high level, particularly in throws. But then you've been asked, okay, can you take them to the next level? And to your credit, you've definitely demonstrated you can do that a couple of times now. So those who who are listening and we haven't alluded to it yet and don't know the background, um, Dale was the national. Was it a national throws coach? National throws coach for, in, in for New Zealand, Zealand, yes. And had success having international medalists, particularly in shot put. Correct. Uh, Male and female um, Olympic medals in, in the shot put there. And uh, decided to move. I was there for eight years. Went for two years, came back eight years later um, with two kids. And uh, you did it properly. Tokyo, did it properly. Uh, Post-Tokyo Olympics and the lockdowns and COVID and all the rest, yeah. decided to uh, relocate back to Melbourne. And now has, has come back and as that story we've just spoken about with Matt Denny has been able to do this very similar thing, uh, him achieving a, a bronze medal at the recent Paris Olympics in the discus. So you mentioned for him some of those things were more on that you know, mental side of the game. Is it always or in your experience does that tend to be a major factor in taking people from this level to the, the really elite level or is it a combination of different things? We obviously alluded to physiology before. Mm. We alluded to the technical aspects and the biomechanics of, of their task. What are the key things that you tend to see or is it completely individualized? I mean, uh, like anything, it's multifactorial uh, and it's bespoke in its nature to that 
you need to understand the context and you need to, you need to go deep on the context uh, of the problem you're trying to solve. The best lessons I've learned as far as taking athletes to the next level never come from athletics. It always comes from a different realm, whether it's military history or whether it's you know, academic sociology or whether it's you know my, my background in pedagogy and teaching and drawing on those and and using those lenses to view the problem usually yields much better clarity for me than actually starting with reps and sets and discus technique and those kind of things. The To answer your question, the biggest lesson I've learned as far as those medal winning projects, so Matt was the, the third athlete I've had on an Olympic podium, which I'm quite proud of. Um, is that you're dealing with human beings who choose to be athletes. I, I coach human beings. I don't coach throws. Yes. I coach people who throw. I think that's the most important lesson. Mm-hmm. You know, like once you realize it's a human and it's a person and they have, as you said, they're multifaceted, it becomes a very, very different puzzle. Very much so. You know, because if it is just the X's and O's, like, oh, that's, mate, that's pretty boring. Actually. Physics is easy. People are complex. <laughs> yeah. And, um, Ultimately, we're trying to solve a people problem. Yeah, well, speak to that because uh, we've had some varied conversations, but you do seem to be able to draw on lots of areas. Where does that come from? Is that a natural curiosity, or is that something that you actually have gone out of your way to try and develop because you saw that the problem can actually be so multifaceted? Yeah, I'll, I'll flesh that out a little bit. Uh, it's only self-awareness around that's only probably clicked in the last couple of years um my father is a is a tree-hugging hippie environmentalist um going back to the 60s and uh was arrested at protests chaining oh, well, himself to bulldozers and you know all those kind of things and and still to this day is now in his 70s um holds those the same level of um passion and investment for those causes Uh, and he's increasingly candid with me around that and figured out over time that the best way to make change was not so much chaining himself to bulldozers but went and got a higher education, got into governance, got into policy writing uh, and is now, you know, supervising professors at uh, universities around the world and is chair of various environmental boards to but still with the same energy of chaining himself to the bulldozer yeah and the lessons that he's offered me around that are recognize your own ego zoom out zoom out even further if it's still a good idea go back and chain yourself to the bulldozer but often when you zoom out you see that there's you can be more effective in different ways by going slowly or by going uh, understanding yourself through more self-awareness and approaching things from a different angle. He told me that uh, essentially most problems in the world are, are tugs of war. You've got um, a bunch of people, Look at whether it's US politics, classic example because we're in the midst of it right now. You've got a red team over here and a blue team over here and they're pulling so hard on the rope doesn't matter which side you jump on. You can only add one person's worth of force to that rope. And when you're talking about hundreds of millions of people across, on it, across a rope, you can make bugger all difference. But if you, if you stand orthogonal to the rope or perpendicular to the rope and put one finger on it, you might be able to move it left or right hmm. um, by taking a different approach and making a difference as one person rather than jumping in the fight. And so every time... I'm now challenged or confronted with a a problem. Uh, that's kind of where I start is to go. What am I not seeing? Yeah, what are what, the angles? What, what are the angles? Explore? Exactly. What are the angles rather than what are my beliefs? And once you understand the angles, you can pick your battles more effectively and spend energy, which is a finite resource. Uh, was there a process by which you came to that self awareness, or was that just? time and, and experiences that led you to kind of I don't know you're a contemplative person generally but is that something that you actually went through a process of like why 
and I'll give you context for this, is a few years back, I had that issue where I felt like I was butting my head against things. And it mm. took me a while to realize, like, I keep making the same mistake, as you said, because I have certain beliefs mm. that unless I'm willing to give up on and come at this from a different angle, I'm going to keep having the same mm. outcome. And it wasn't until I realized, I was like, ah, oh, shit. How did you realize it? Well, I wasn't getting the results that I wanted. Mm. Right? Like, I remember having a conversation mm. about four years ago with um, Cliff Mallet. Yes. And I was calling basically the coaches that I thought had had the type of success that I was trying to seek in sprint coaching. And I was calling these different people, you know, another one was Tudor Bitter and I was calling these guys and, and saying, you know, like I'm getting people to national final level, but I can't seem to get them beyond that. Right. And they were really good about it. You know, the, they were really helpful and they were so open and they were so giving of their time, which even to this day, you know, I, I'm quite close with Tudor now, but anytime I see Cliff, I, I still say thank you for the conversations that I had with him. And the funny part was it wasn't actually that I was seeking X's and O's. I don't, wouldn't say I, I coach in any way that's like them, um, especially knowing more of Judah's program. But the thing that it made me realize is, okay, I need to give up on these, some of these things that I thought were core structural things within my coaching. Mm. And they actually just weren't mm. at all. Mm. And give me an example. Well, I think we've spoken about, uh, actually, I might not have, I, might, I think, I believe I spoke about this with actually with James Mortimer while we were in Montpellier and said, like, I no longer have an entrenched idea around, say, central nervous system fatigue. A lot of sprint coaches are heavily influenced by the work of Charlie Francis. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea of, like, basically it's set, you know, the amount of neurological or central load that you can undertake when you under, when you, participate in very high intensive tasks and if that's you know if you guys maybe you you were talking about in throws it's you know doing very very heavy lifting um, very explosive stuff you know maximal throws i'm not 100 percent aware of how it would work exactly in throws but in sprints it's you know doing max velocity work or a volume of that and people i was getting i personally and a lot of coaches they get really scared of it. it's like oh we did max velocity work so we can't do anything now for that's anywhere near that level of intensity mm. for 48, 72 plus hours. How do you know? And I, I was really strict on that. I was programming around this. And then I was like, wait a minute. You know, if you go into a championship, you might need to run fast every round and you don't have a break in between. So I was like, I can either try and coach my athletes through that process and expose them to that in our training environment, mm. or I can just hope and cross my fingers that they can do it when we get to the championship. And the way to get around it was like, okay, well, if I just abandon that idea, because if you actually look at, you know, and I'm like, you, I go and read it. If you have to look at the literature, there's basically nothing that really clearly delineates what occurs within that process and these timelines. Now we know that there's a reduction in say the motor outflow. And we know that some of the sensory input changes mm -hmm. at the spinal cord level and even at the central level, but there's actually no strong evidence that like it takes this amount of time in these athletes. And the other observation I kept making was early in the season, if we had an event that was multiple races in a day or multiple days in a row, the athletes really were fatigued from that. Mm. You know, so we did it the first time and it's like, oh, everyone's really tired. Everyone's really sore. You do it the second time in the season or the third time. And they're like, oh, I'm fine. Mm. They're back to training on Monday. They feel good. They can do fast stuff mm. or, you know, something that's relatively high intensity. I'm like, mm, there's actually quite a bit of adaptability when you expose them to, you know, this higher intense work. Now, whether you even put that into a category and you want to use the term central nervous fatigue, I won't touch on because I think people use it as a catch-all term and it's mm. obviously much more broad than that. Mm. Um, and there's very specific physiological features that are, are associated with that. But I just kind of was like, I think there's more adaptability here than what people think. And, you know, someone that you, you know as well, quite well, Avish, um, uh, he works obviously as a performance scientist and physiologist with uh, the VIS, Victorian Institute of Sport. And I had multiple conversations with him about this idea. I was like, is there really any evidence that that's the parameter that doesn't have adaptability? You know, because every other area of physiology is malleable. Is, is yeah. hugely malleable. Mm -hmm. So why do we have this entrenched thought of like, oh, no, nah, 
you ran a PB, you better shut it down for 10 days. You know, so like anyone who ever says that, and there are coaches that say this stuff, you know, even within the realm that we work in, I get really wary really quickly because I'm like, well, okay, that's a limiting belief. If you think your athlete only has a finite adaptable, you know, capacity or a packet of capability, you're probably limiting them. Yeah, and and I guess the other concurrent factor along that uh, same line of thinking is that what's true now may not be true in a month, six months, a year. So what is a, a hard line or perceived hard line and it's usually a judgment. Ultimately, mm. it's it's a judgment call between coach, athlete, one well, or the other. There are obviously you can reach hard lines, and you mentioned this. You alluded to this at the start of like you felt like you probably reached your capacity yeah. as an athlete. Yeah, and I think some people do, but we start making those calls sometimes when an athlete's twenty two. It's like they're not yeah. they're not finished yet. No, absolutely not. Right? Like especially if the training age isn't significantly you know long. And the the reality of my own end of one situation calling time on my own athletics career was I'd realistically probably just reached the ceiling of what I could have done with the same level of beliefs, structures, systems, yes. and training. Um, and what I, if I did want to continue on, that was the, what needed to change. I didn't need to work any harder or, you know, necessarily reshuffle the deck as it was, but changing your mind's hard and, there's a cost to it, and that cost gets even uh, – when you start getting third-party investments and things, and I, I don't mean necessarily financial investments, although it does include that, sponsors, uh, you know, promoters, spouses, yeah, yeah, people managers, involved. all yeah. those kind of things, the inertia to change is, is um, significant. Mm. It's significant. Uh, if Mondo Duplantis went back and said, hey, I, I think I'm actually – left-handed and i think i could jump even higher off you know i could jump seven there'd be a lot of pushback on that there'd be a lot of pushback you say it might might take me two or three years to figure out and i'm going to fail out a lot and all the rest so it takes a certain usually it takes either a crisis um or a a ceiling of frustration which is what matt had um being on the cusp of something but not being able to turn that over and see the other side um but it sounds like the common denominator in all of those situations is the ability to say what if i'm wrong Mm. yeah definitely and as i said like uh, i always tell people this because obviously a lot of people have success in their field however i don't know that those fields are always that objective and it's one of the things that i love the most about coaching is uh, some people probably perceive me as being a know-it-all um and they're probably right on lots of levels but i feel like i speak to the things that i know about and i've thought about and i've spent time learning about and the reason that I feel okay to say that is because coaching has humbled me so much and so often that I am very comfortable knowing what I know and what I don't know. And the reason it does that is because it doesn't matter how smart you are. If you don't get the result, then the approach you're taking is not the right approach. Mm. And that to me has been the biggest and most important life lesson I think I've ever learned. And it came through undertaking a task like coaching, mm. um, which I don't know that a lot of people get that, you know. They get a relative success, as I said, in their career, but there's no real way of going, you're right or wrong, because sometimes people aren't that good, but they make lots of money or they get promoted or they have some level of notoriety. It's not as objective and it's not as clear of like the athlete wins or they don't win or they progress or they don't progress. Mm. You can say the same for a long time in say the corporate world and probably still be considered successful. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we're all subject to incentives and behaviorally, evolutionarily, Incentives are the thing that drives human behavior. And once you get above a certain threshold of hierarchy of needs, we're playing with free money. Yes. That's the thing we've got to keep in mind. And I always try and remind myself it's yes. too important to be taken seriously. Like it, it actually doesn't matter. It feels like a bad race or a bad comp or whatever it, you know, is the end of the world. But we know that's not the case. And increasingly, um, I'm trying to remind myself of that, keep it front and center, that you're always playing with house money. Here's a question for you. How do you get that balance right? Because at times, and this is me being open, I feel like when I go into that mode, 
I probably lose some of the sharp motivation because I'm like, well, it doesn't actually mean as much. Mm. How do you balance it? Because you've had much more success than I have as a coach, and it seems like you're still very acutely aware of keeping that. Within well, your mind. well, I'd, I'd I'd push back on you saying success as a coach. I'd say I'd probably just don't be modest. No, I, I, I'm not being <laughs> modest. I'm not being falsely modest. I'm just saying uh, we define success in coaching poorly. The, the, well, the, I, yes. I, I, but I'm happy to, to, be to admit it. I, I've I've coached athletes to a Olympic medals, a, a higher level. Yeah, but that doesn't mean I'm a better coach. It might just mean they're better athletes. I, I didn't That's say better. So, I yeah. said successful. So, okay. Yeah. Correct. Valid. Valid. Um, Returning to your question, how do you balance that out? How do you manage that narrative? So, the, the again, coming back to Matt, because we've spoken about him before yeah, yeah. and there's a recency bias here, but the framing that he needed to, that we, I say we, have made an effort to readjust was we will accept disappointment because we're playing with house money. Hmm. We won't accept regret. So playing defense, trying to protect anything or beat the guys behind you, that's we would regret that approach. Mm. Um, and that goes right back from the actual competition on game day. You are going there to win. Yes. That is it. At play offense, six throws. If you foul out, but you, you've had you've got every, you've, you've had Every one of those you can sign off and hand on heart, go to bed at night. I have so much respect for that. You know, like I had this conversation actually this morning with someone we're talking about, uh, you know, Femke Bowl. Mm. And I don't know the the in-depth discussions that were being had, but my sense is that she ended up finishing third because she tried to win, Mm -hmm. which I have so much more respect for completely than a guaranteed second. Yeah. If she'd missed the final or, or, torn her hammy on you know at the 300 doing that it's going to be disappointing that's going to hurt mm. but you'll sleep well for the rest of your life because yeah, you, that's how you took you, your swing yeah you took your swing throw your punch and if, sometimes you get knocked out like matt matt was beaten by two olympic records mm. so be it so be it we'll take that uh you know has that been the sentiment from him has he been okay with it because no watching the competition <laughs> live you know, if, as an Australian watching it, and I don't know, I know Matt well enough to say hello, but it, basically it's like, oh, shit, he's, he's, he's in this. And then all of a sudden people just start throwing Olympic records and you're like, ah. Oh. And especially, I don't know about you, but especially the Jamaican, that kind of came yeah. a little bit from nowhere. It, it did, but in his own way, he played offense and yeah. they, only, they only count your best one on, mm. the, on the score sheet. So he, um, that narrative, according to that narrative, it's getting better with time. Matt's acute reaction was unsurprisingly one of disappointment. Yeah. Um, he was you know, two feet away from being Olympic gold medalist and that will still take some time to process, but I was pretty quick to get under the stadium and give him a clip before he got in front of any microphones and say, hey, look, I, I understand you yeah, feeling came disappointment here to win. Yeah. Like, and we came here to win. You have every right to feel disappointed, but you need to put on a happy face for the cameras here and and reflect some gratitude uh, because this will get better with time, uh, and it has. You know, he's feeling better about it every day, not because of how far he threw or where he finished in the comp, but because of how he went about it. And at least you know five of the six throws in the final, and how he went about the last months, years worth of preparation has been in line with that uh, moral compass of mm. accepting disappointment but not accepting regret. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really, really strong message of how do you behave in a way that is in accordance with your values. And as you said, that may be agreed upon values. But if you do that, then you can sleep well at night. You know? And it doesn't mean that in the moment you're not disappointed because I think that's sure. Yeah. And there are people you've got to bring with you on that journey mm. too because uh, – Tight team around, obviously, coach, spouse, um, those who are paying the bills, those kind of things, mm. make a concerted effort to communicate with them, hey, this is how we're going to go about it. And it, from the outside, it might, it's going to creak at times and we're going to have, you know, we're not, but we're not going to drop it back to second gear here. Mm. This is how we play the game and it, so be it. And 
realistically then what's happened over time is that your your bottom level gets recalibrated to a much higher bandwidth and and you end up just being uh, pretty tight you don't have big misses because that's how a general adaptation syndrome mm. works generally you know on that you, you, there's two things I want to ask you about the first one is you mentioned the team how strong are you on protecting that environment because it's something that I've noticed as I've started to coach at higher levels a lot of people externally do not understand what's required in those environments and so I felt more and more pressure to control who comes into the environment you know you, you make it very clear it's like this is our team we're not really letting other people in unless they demonstrate a very high degree of understanding of this environment. Flesh that out a little for me from your perspective, if you could. Perfect example is one of my athletes, when, I, when they ended up getting into the VIS, there were only certain people that were allowed to be involved in their management. Right? And that was coordinated through you know, Nikki, who obviously you work with at the VIS, who's the coordinator. And I've got a really good relationship with her. I said, Nikki, like these are the things that we're after. I don't actually want anyone else contacting me or the athlete, and especially not the athlete. Mm-hmm. They have a bit of a habit of wanting to help, mm-hmm. which is on the surface it seems very, uh, you know, valiant. But athletes are not always discerning of that kind of understanding of who they should let into the team, mm-hmm. and they see so-called free services as, you know, it's like the buffet. Yep. And they're like, oh, I want a bit of that. I want a bit of this. Yep. And I've had to be really careful of like, we're not going to let some of these people in until we really understand what they're about, what their approach is, even sometimes what their motivation for wanting to get involved are. Because mm-hmm. they're- I understand that. It's a big one, I think, in track and field. I think it's in every sport. Practitioners, whether they be support staff or coaches, love to associate themselves with success. And I'm sure you've seen that when someone's going well, everyone's hanging on. And then the moment something drops off, all of a sudden the team goes back to a really small team again. Mm. Um, so I'm very careful about it's like, this is our team. These are the people we let in. These are the people that we will have strong, open, honest discussions with. You know, and that can include family, as you said, mm. partners, spouses, whatever it is. But that's our team. We're not going to just keep expanding it forever, especially if someone starts to have success. People want to get in on that. Mm. You know, people love getting on the gravy train, as you know. So I've had to be really, really cautious of that. And I'm open with the athletes. Like, We'll build our team. If we feel like, okay, we're missing something, we need to bring someone into that. But it's someone that we've selected mm. and that we're both comfortable with mm. or you know, whoever else is in the team is comfortable with. Not just, oh, this is the, early, like, the most available or – someone that is going to be free or, you know, because they're offering the service. Mm. So it, it's, a, I don't know, I found that a real challenge at times and I'm sure it only gets harder, as you said, as the pressure goes up and the level of performance goes up. Yeah. The, I've definitely evolved in the, it's my 10th year coaching professionally, um, evolved my approach and exposure to team sports is, influence that too um i'm probably a little more porous than you yeah uh, no like your your reticence makes me feel like you're like i don't i don't agree and like i flesh that out though explain no i will there's some stuff i don't agree with you on and we'll get to that um Hmm. but i completely understand where you're coming from i guess it's 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 more of a different approach rather than Hmm. different belief uh my approach is if the athlete and I, ultimately just the athlete. Yeah, yeah. If the athlete is clear enough on what they want and what they need in order to achieve this task or to, to walk this path, then they can manage those relationships and I don't need to. Oh, no, I agree with you on that. I'm saying- so if someone wants to come and stand in the discus cage, you know, in, in pre-camp and powwow and whatever, I trust Matt to be able to manage or give, at least I'll give him the opportunity to say yay or nay. Yeah. And if he's not, then I will. Oh, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Uh, I, I'm saying more that there are people who I think sometimes want to get involved who they're not necessarily doing it for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. What's the right reasons? 
Well, one of the examples that I give, well, not even the right reasons, it's probably the wrong term to use. I think that sometimes they bring their own layer of like belief structures that maybe isn't in alignment with what you've been working on. You know, like as, as the example goes, and like, I'll be open about this one because I think this is, it's a controversial area. So I put my hand up, but say for instance, coaching female athletes, talking about body mass Mm -hmm. and uh, their, you know, general physique can be really sensitive in the current climate of women's sport. Now, if you've got good relationships with the athletes and the professionals, it's not a problem at all. But there are, and there have been a number of psychologists and dietitians that I've worked with who are really scared of that topic and they see any discussion of the athlete needing to, say, reduce their body, you know, their fat mass um, and improve their, you know, general physique uh, as being, you know, negative or being sort of body image conscious. And it's not an easy topic to actually navigate at times, but it requires a lot of openness and it requires a lot of honesty and transparency and systems in place and checks and balances. Mm. But I've had some really uh, forward conversations with some of the professionals because they basically tried to say to my athlete, like, don't worry about your body mass. Like, that doesn't doesn't affect your performance at all. Yeah, physics would argue otherwise. And that's literally (laughs) what I said to them. I was like, look, you know nothing about the event, Mm. right? Now, I understand totally if this athlete is using a pathological body image kind of schematic to the, their world, and that is something we want to avoid as much as possible, and we need to put strategies in place if we see that. But you cannot bring your belief structure that that doesn't matter because it does matter. And the athlete's not stupid. Mm. The athlete knows that not, it's not even how they perceive themselves in reference to other people, which is sometimes the case. But these athletes, like, they know, they're like, when, especially in, you know, jump events, sprint events, like, okay, when I'm lean, I run fast. Yep. I jump high. Yeah. They're not stupid. Yeah. Isaac right? Newton got that clocked a little while ago. Exactly. So, like, these are the kind of conversations, like, eh, we're not letting you in our team because your belief structure, we need to go seek out someone else, right, who does understand this and is going to tackle it in a way that is sensitive to all of the needs of this. Mm. And, like, we've done that a number of times where there's heaps of people that, I would say a part of our team, but we've had to kind of very heavily kind of navigate that and make sure that their belief structure is similar to the one that we're, and it, like the example would be as well as, and I've heard this and it hasn't happened with us. We work obviously closely with Aaron, who, you know, biomechanist, mm-hmm. but biomechanist giving coaching advice. And it's like, mm, that's not your place, mate. Mm. You know, you've got to be really careful with that, you know, unless they are an expert in that area and then mm. you want their advice. Mm. Um, you know, I'm sure you are there seen. examples of that. Well, I don't want to out anyone, so no, no but sorry, uh, expertise in a certain domain that you would say, Hey, look, I'm not the smartest person in the room here. Can you steer the ship on this one? Or do you oh, totally, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any examples with, with my athletes, yeah, yeah, yeah multiple times. Like, you know, for instance, I lean very, very heavily on the medical team, yep, right, even though I'm a health professional. Mm-hmm. Right, like we've had a number of my athletes actually have illness issues, and I'm in conversations with you know Paul Blackman constantly. I send athletes to him all the time, where I'm like, Paul, whatever you think we need to do, I will lean on your expertise here. I'm not going to try and navigate this because I think that I'm, you know, a microbiologist. Like mm-hmm. I don't understand. The, mm-hmm. Like, I, and it's an athlete that I coach that's a bit younger, but I'd never had an athlete who had glandular fever, mm-hmm. and literally like. I'm talking to Paul, like, you know, basically she was seeing Paul once a month and I'm talking to him every month. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this and how do I navigate the training load? Because I think she can do more, but like, what do you think? He's like, her bloods are here. I think you can go to this. And I was very heavily guided by him on that. Mm. Um, another one was a psychologist that I got really close with um, who worked through some of our networks and I would have conversations with them all the time. Mm. And it was about like, they were, I actually spoke to them quite often about the idea of like, what kind of communication do you think I need to be having? Because I feel like I'm actually not helping the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried that actually, funny stories. I tried that with one psychologist and he just thought I was an absolute nutcase. Mm. So did, that didn't. It, as in. I was, went out seeking help. Counsel for yourself. Not for myself, for my coaching. Yeah. I'm like, these are the things I'm trying to develop. 
because the other question that I was alluding to before, and I'm going to ask you is like, you seem to be very intuitive with psychology of things. So we'll talk about that in a moment, but I went out seeking, I'm like, I, I need to get better with how I communicate. I need to get better with even my, you know, nonverbal uh, communication, all of those things. So I went out seeking a psychologist to say like, can you help me and coach, like coach me up in this area of psychological development so that I can be a better coach. And we didn't gel that well. So it ended up going south pretty quickly. Um, but I ended up developing that relationship with one of the psychologists at the VIS. Great. Unfortunately, they ended up going on leave because of, um, and not, it was a great reason. She had, she had children, but um, you know, I had a great relationship with her. I was like speaking to her all the time, like, "What do you think of this? How do I have I approached that properly?" Mm. And there's times she'd literally say, "Like, oh mate, like, yeah, you fuck that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, don't say that. that. Line. Yeah. yeah. Well, not so much analog, but like." Yeah, that approach is probably oh, amplifying the wrong It's thing. on you, yeah. Yeah, you know I mean? and I'm like, ah, yeah. shit, all right, yeah. back that up. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of times I've had that. But I'm just really cautious of who those people are because I think, like, you, you want people in your team that you can be open with, they can be open with you, and they're not concerned about that because they see that their value is in trying to enhance mm. the outcome for that athlete. Yeah, I, I guess there are myriad different ways to orchestrate uh, campaigns and teams and mm. and well, there that, is here's a question though because it sounds like you don't see yourself necessarily as the person who orchestrates that is, is that the case uh, or do you feel like you are the person that orchestrates I that? feel like the orchestration happens uh, vicariously okay. through settings of standard and culture and Basically, it's small stuff. What will we tolerate? What will we not? Where okay. do we want to go? Here's a question for you, though, because I feel like your coaching is a little bit different to the coaching that I've done in the sense of I feel like you've gone into the system a little bit higher to start with. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the athletes that you've done, uh, done really well with, I think, have actually are a little bit older. Yes. Right? Yes. And so some of these kind of structures may already be in place. Mm. My perception is that I'm starting with athletes who they might be on the path, but they're much earlier. Yes. And so I'm having to build some of those behaviors. Mm. They're not, or if I wasn't coaching them, they would have come with those behaviors, but you're coming in at a, like a later stage. Yeah, oh, that's sense. valid. Yeah. So I don't know how I would be if I got someone who came in later, be like, oh, okay, I kind of trust that you know what's going on already. Uh, <laughs> you still need to shake the snow globe. Yes. And see where it settles. And a lot of the time it settles back exactly where it was, but. Um, I have basic litmus tests around how I like to see things operating and a certain resonance of agitation that needs to stay there. Um, and <laughs> when, when you say that, what do you mean by agitation? I, if practice in any domain slips into acceptance or apathy, then we're not adapting and it's not. How, how do you see yourself in that environment as an agitator? Because I have, I'm, I'm, you know. As You're some, an agitator. Oh, massively. But I, and I enjoy it, right? Which I have to educate my athletes that mm. like, that's part of my personality. Yeah. But I, I find it really interesting because I spend time actually telling them exactly what you just said. Like mm. my job, you know, in a healthy manner is to push you. And that's not just in your physical capabilities. Mm. That is to keep developing your belief structures. And mm. I've got to put you in uncomfortable situations. Mm. And I'm doing it on purpose. Mm. And I want to see what you do. Mm. Right? So like part of your job is to, to navigate that and come up with a solution for yourself because mm. that's growth. Yeah. And I guess the, the other bookmark on that bandwidth of agitation is it needs to stay below the threshold of tipping into threat. Yes. And when, when it tips into threat, and I've seen that, um, all of a sudden you go from being a skillful agitator to being an asshole. Mm. Um, you can beat this podcast if you need to. but that, <laughs> No, no, no. Yeah, you and I have got the same personality tropes in that way of an well, appetite for agitation. Yeah. That is. Um, well, I, I get myself really in natural. trouble because I tend to go over it too often. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that for you. And the um, self awareness around that's just really what what needs to be kept in check. It's not it's not a right or wrong, good or bad, but 
certainly as far as orchestrating, coming back to the term we used before, um, orchestrating is an adjective to pull together variables in a direction. Uh, you need to have skin in the game and you need to go with people through that. And I think they need to see you do it as well. What, what, um, when you say that, what does that look like as a coach having skin in the game and, and see? And you say, see you do that? What, what, what do you think that that looks like? I've made a resolution for myself that I will only coach on a contract basis okay. um, because if I'm not performing and I'm not able to orchestrate or agitate towards the agreed upon outcome, then I should not have tenure based on anything I've done in the past or how good my agreements are or relationships I love that. are yeah, or I how think well that... I'm doing in the footy tipping contest. How does, that, how does that go with athletes though? Do you think that it should be done bi-directionally? Go on. Well, I've had this thought before in the sense of I think that one of the things that I've struggled with as a coach is I feel like once I commit to coaching someone, I mean, mm. and some people, and it's like it's their nature, but they, they take a little bit of time to trust. Mm. And I've thought about the idea of, as I said, putting a bi-directional kind of thing of like, I owe you X mm. in whatever, however you want to quantify. That's probably, O is probably not the right word, but you need to bring yourself to the table too, you know? Mm. And if neither of us are doing that at, you know, 12 months or six months or mm. whatever the agreed upon, you know, uh, contract is, we can terminate on, on both behalf. All right. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you feel like, you want it more than the athlete wants oh, it. All the time. But, yeah. It's the biggest frustration as any coach, I think, that we all have is, and then like I've even, you know, I would I say I, would, I reckon I feel that all the time. Mm. Um, how, do you, how do you manage that? Well, I think it's about having the conversations with the athletes and trying to, you know, it's like, it, it's like in any relationship, sometimes you actually, you, you, time goes on and then you've got to come back and sit down and reassess and have that conversation. Like, where are we at? You know, happen, happen, happens in your marriage. You, you know need to punctuate. Like, yeah. To punctuate. Yeah, it happens in your marriage. You go like, how are we actually going? Like, you know, things seem good, but like, yeah. are they actually going well? Yeah. And I think part of it is, it's interesting. I wouldn't mind asking you this. Is One of the things I've realized about my coaching and the, the struggles that I've had actually more recently have been around, I like being quite close with the athletes on a personal level mm -hmm. because I feel like I can get much better outcomes when we actually get along really well. Mm -hmm. The athletes that I haven't done well with are the ones who like to keep their distance. Mm -hmm. And I don't, at the moment, I'm not sure how to navigate that other than to say, like, if you're not interested in having that kind of interaction, then maybe I'm not the right environment to come and mm. work with. Well, it's good you've got that level of self-awareness. I mm. guess the being explicit around how you overlap that Venn diagram is pretty critical mm. um, up front and note, knowing that that does change uh, my the immediate kind of asterisk that pops up for me there is there's a gravitational pull towards uh, shared experience over time you do get closer um, with athletes mm. and then the risk of groupthink and uh, yeah that's a real suboptimal overlap um, becomes as you I say, think, a danger. I think one of the reasons for it is, you know, at the level I coach, whilst there is some sort of, you know, financial side of it, it's not done at a level where it's like, okay, this is a major, you know, project that involves a lot of money. And I think when you go into professional sport, there is a clear delineation. Like you're being paid to deliver this. Correct. So if you're not delivering that, who cares necessarily how close you were with the yeah. people you're working with? They might think you're the best person in the world, but that doesn't matter. Well, a lot of the time in team sport, in particular, it's the opposite. Mm. It's we don't get along on on anything, and there yes. are no circumstances outside of wearing the same jersey on the field that we would ever associate with each other. However, in this setting, in and I've had situations like that, less so on the field, more so off the field with other uh, bombastic personalities in in high performance sport, which is pretty common. Mm. Um, People who are fairly strongly opinionated in their fields and 
we don't necessarily see eye to eye or they don't have that same appetite how, for How have you navigated agitation. that? Because I know that like you're a personable individual. You like to spend time with people, especially probably more the coaches and things that you are having to work with. Mm. How do you navigate that when it's like, I actually don't really like this person, mm. but I actually am going to have to work with them day in, day out. And we have well, I come and do their podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the good thing for you is you don't have to work with me much. Well, mate, the... It, it loops back to what we said before that what if I'm wrong? Hmm. What if I'm, what if, I, what am I not seeing here? I've got, I've made an immediate short term acute assessment of this is not someone I'm gelling with. We're not on the same frequency here. And I've got two options. Either I can pull it apart and then put a lot of energy into trying to keep it as, you know, separate entities, or I can try to understand hmm. and, that takes time, meeting people halfway. Um, everyone's lens is different. Everyone's context is different. But usually once you start to understand where someone's come from and why they feel the way they feel, it, it dissolves a little bit and you shake the snow globe and you still might fall separately, but you can coexist peacefully rather mm. than um, have to circle around one another and that I, I do see that as performance enhancing because the less energy I have to put into managing all of those multitude of relationships and who's in, who's out, who's with, who, who's in charge of this, the more I've got to apply to the task. And the mm. task is how do I make the ball go further? Mm. And concurrently with that, there is an interpersonal reality of the landscape we live in and. Uh, I guess that's probably an appreciation now that I didn't have in the first five to 10 years of my professional coaching practice that um, I could, it would be easy to look back and say, I wish I knew then what I knew now, but I think similar to adolescence, you've, you've got to be an idiot to know you don't yeah. want to be an idiot. And, you've got to go through yeah. those experiences. Yeah. You know, like obviously Jack's not here today, but we talk about this a lot and we've spoken about it a number of times on the podcast, but like, I think that experiential learning actually can't be sped up. No. Um, and and you're doing as, a disservice to try and speed it up. Yeah, yeah, you're actually missing out on the point of it. Yeah, and we speak about that a lot as you know health professionals. It's like now that we're 15 years into being you know, physios, it's like mm. you see things and you, you can feel things and you can have an understanding of something that it doesn't matter whether you had that level of knowledge. You actually had to have felt it and experienced yeah. it and seen that number of patients with this kind of presentation before you can apply it. Yeah, mm. and. Our sport is not conducive to necessarily learning things on that kind of time horizon mm. um, because stuff is urgent and it's urgent relative to the, this athlete has a race on this day and how do we – we've got eight days until this and it, you get down to fractals of hours and minutes and those mm. kinds of things. But I couldn't agree with you, agree with you more on um, at a longitudinal perspective and that's ultimately where we can make real influence is setting a course across decades rather than days. What you do within the contents of one particular session is almost inconsequential. Um, it's a cumulative effect that, that ultimately determines where things land and, and now is an appropriate time post-Olympics, uh, I guess, for, for you and I who are both over there to maybe shake our own snow globes and mm. say, where are we headed with this and how do we want to manage those things? And uh, certainly I, I'm, I'm a much less, um, got a lot less answers than I did five years ago and a lot more questions. And, and I do think that's probably one of my strengths as a, as a coach now is to be able to ask skillful questions rather than give correct answers. Uh, d definitely is one of your major strengths. It's been really enjoyable, you know, spending a little bit of time with you after not seeing you for a long time. But you just asking questions, I think, is a really strong trait that you have. And it comes, I think, from your curiosity. I'm going to change tack just slightly for a moment. I want to ask you a little bit about your background as a teacher. Because when you were talking before about seeing people from all walks of life and trying to understand, do you think that that comes from that experience as a teacher and having to work with children of all different walks of life? 
yeah, I mean, we're we're recording this podcast uh, in Abbotsford, yeah, in Abbotsford, in straight across the road from from us is uh, the Housing Commission flats, um, Hoddle Street, and because uh, you just taught- on the other side of that is yeah. St Joseph's Primary, and so I taught at St Joe's, St Joey's. Uh, Whilst I was competing, mm. whilst I went to the Olympics, I was teaching. Teaching, and ninety-five percent of the student population at St Joey's Primary live in the Housing Commission flats mm. uh, here. So, uh, high Sudanese immigrant population, high Vietnamese uh, population, uh, Indigenous Australian population at the school, and clientele. And you can only imagine the the issues and um, uh, upbringings that these kids are having growing up in commission in, flats. Yeah, different um, environments, yeah. And for me, who grew up on the leafy, sunny um, golf course laden, surf beach laden Mornington Peninsula to come up here and, and spend the time there, I, I, I learned more about myself and society um, teaching primary school than I have coaching international sport or mm. going to Olympics and any, any of those kind of things. Do you think um, that that's coloured a lot of the way you approach things? Or Undoubtedly, it? yeah. uh, it'd be remiss not not to think it has. I, I don't necessarily think consciously, but uh, well, it seems like uh, you know. In this conversation, I'm, I'm cutting off, but it's very clear that you are a much more open person to different people of different walks of life, even than what I'm perceiving I am. And I'm interested to know kind of where you think that's come from. Because it, it's actually a very endearing trait that you're like, well, you know, people have different approaches and there's lots of reasons for that and I'm, and I'm okay to try and understand that. Yeah, I mean, we've all had those conversations around the false dichotomy of, of nature-nurture, but if we use that, use that language and the etymology of it, nature-nurture – drives all of our behaviour. It's one of those variables. And yes, that's an outdated dichotomy. I we'll accept that. that, yeah. However, you didn't choose your nature. I oh, yeah, you didn't choose your genetics. You didn't choose where you were born or your parents or your chromosomes or somatotype. You know? So you can't claim any responsibility for that, nor should you claim any blame. Nurture, you didn't choose... The settings, the context that yeah, you were, or even the time in which you were born, the time in which you were born, yeah. the the location, the was it wartime, peacetime. You, know, you flip the coin again, and it's you and I growing up in the housing commission flats here, or we're in Mariupol mm. right now, and uh, neither of those factors were chosen or determined, just necessarily desired by by the individual. So we need to be caring um, and understanding before we're judgmental mm. and, and the reinforcement of the hierarchy of needs for human beings was just so front and centre every day teaching primary school because the number one thing they're looking for there is not the curriculum, it's not NAPLAN, it's not a lesson plan, it's, it's not structure, it is Someone who turns up and gives them security. I mm. e. I turn up to school every day, and I know Mr. Dale's going to be there, and I know I can trust him. Mm. Um, if I'm in trouble, I can go to him. If I need to go to the toilet, I can go to him. If I need, you know, I haven't had breakfast, or I haven't, you know, because mum and dad didn't get home last night, which is more common than you think. I can go to Mr. Dale, and he'll help me out. He'll organise something. Yeah. That that is your ninety plus percent of your function. My function is turn up, mm. just be there, be there. Be and we figure the rest there, out later. Yeah. Be consistent, turn up, and I do think that applies to to our um, quote unquote high performance world. Is you just got to turn up, and you got to care, you got to mm. give a shit, and from there you can solve the problem any different way. And you don't have to be the smartest person in the room because we live in the information age. You can get anything you need. You can get anything you need. You can ask questions. You can harvest. The, the skill now is not knowing the information. The skill is harvesting the information. And um, that's what I'm challenging myself to do is to be a, a skillful harvester of the relevant information and pull in what I need and reject what I, what I don't and evolve that over time 
rather than stand there with a white lab coat and a clipboard and yeah. point at the board and say, this is, this is what I know. This is what I know. And, and all of the best practitioners longitudinally have all done that. So you go back to even, it's had a kind of renaissance of romance, but uh, Dr. Bondichuk's work. Yeah, I was going to bring up uh, Bondichuk before. Yeah, yeah, for a couple of decades and everyone refers back to that and as they should. Um, paradigm shifting intellect and, and understanding. The thing that Dr. B did, does, and instills in those who know him well and know him closely enough, I've had the fortune to meet him a couple of times, is he is wed to the scientific method of mm. what works, works. Lean into that, push away what doesn't. Nothing is sacred. And, yeah. and part of that is an immutable part of that is we are always going to be working with human beings. Mm. Um, I think you, you had touched on something there that we have spoken a lot about on this podcast before, but is I think as coaches, one of the things that the, the coaches that I perceive to be, you know, better coaches and take that term however you like, but uh, is that they are immensely curious and they're willing to run what we call like safe to fail experiments. They're always tinkering with things. How do you get that balance right when you're working at the level you're working at where experimentation, as you said, can actually come with some resistance from whether it's the team or the individual? Because I feel like as coaches, it's in our nature to want to tinker with things and want to explore things. How do you balance that at the really high level? Because there's pressure not to change things if things are particularly going well. But as a coach and as someone who, as you said, understands this process you can't keep doing the same thing because you will actually go back you go go backwards it's you know it's the entropic kind of process for sure yeah i mean we always devolve towards chaos Mm. uh cumulative experience um helps and i guess you're similar to what you said in a clinical sense you do develop intuition um and i guess the way that that's delivered it now making the conscious effort to say this is what not rather than say this is what it is or this is what you need to do based on prior experience and based on prior belief this prior belief this is what it's likely to look like and mm. potentially a, an intervention that may direct it this way but it's always an experiment and we run it we test it we monitor it along the way and if it's not going the way we want it go it we don't need to change the experiment we need to change our beliefs mm. And that's uh, if you don't uphold that humility to run that process and be prepared to flip your beliefs on their head, you just end up banging your head against the wall mm. and it will you'll be humbled against your will rather yes. than through your will. <laughs> um, and we've had that too. We've had that too. I mean... Tokyo, the, the leading to Tokyo with lockdowns and the variables there and trying to steer a few campaigns uh, through towards those games applied a lot of climatic time pressures uh, and I did revert back to some of those concretized yes, no, do this now approaches to things um, that I look back on and shake my head but do you think but I'd be, I'd was... be con- contextually, I, I've got to be as kind to myself as what I just described yeah. as being kind enough to the kids at mm. St. Joseph's Primary is context is everything. Mm. You know, when, when people are... When the world seems when to be the losing its mind. When the world's losing its mind and things are stressful, it's understanding, understandable that people will make stressful decisions and mm. we, we revert back to certainty. That's why people like... Well, it's why see people, the appeal of Donald Trump or whatever. It's black white. Well, that's why white, people like the lockdowns. Yeah. Whether they were in the long term they were useful or not is not really the question. It's why do people overwhelmingly in certain parts of the world in Melbourne want to support it was because it was certain. Yes, right. It was like we, we gravitate as, as much as it sucked on lots of levels. Like, well, we we know what we can expect. We can stay in our house. That's what you can expect. A hundred percent, hundred percent. And and in the age of Instagram and social media and marketing around so, so much about the coaching realm now is just blurred lines to marketing is you know, here are the five things you need to do if you mm. want to be a you know 11 five sprinter or whatever mm. and oh i can i can pay attention for five things tell me the five things you know click this link and it's less sexy to have someone who says well 
actually it, it depends and it's going to take us a year to figure out. But if we go slow now, we can go fast later. Mm. Go, I don't mean fast as in stopwatch. I no, mean fast as in process, yeah. yeah. Um, and once you develop that, an appetite for that relationship uh, or that way of doing things, that methodology, it's it's perpetually satiating, you know. That's why Dr. B can do it for decades and those who've been around yeah. him are infected by that same uh, methodology. Is It, it really does... Um, gets in your bones yeah <laughs> i'm conscious of time because we've been going for a bit and the last question we tend to ask people but i i feel like i'm going to get a good answer from you so hopefully you don't disappoint us well, i'm going to interject it's our okay. second last question because i did say i had one stored for you so all right you go, 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 go. yours first go, go. do you want me to go you can go all right we were we were in uh pre-camp before the games mm. and and um there were two things that resonated and I texted you the next day. I was like, there's something that just I was sitting with me the next day. So I'm going to hit you with it. You alluded to in training your philosophy as a coach being one of pragmatism, which is admirable, i.e. what works, works. You're not wed to any one ideology, which I think is admirable. Yeah. Um, let's put that bucket over here. Second one was you also alluded to at times there are relationships or people or interpersonal factors that uh, you don't uh, potentially Enjoy. have a tolerance or an enjoyment of or an yeah. appetite for. Thank you for helping me out there. Um, and that you would just – the way to handle that is just to bifurcate mm. um, and appreciate your honesty on that one. <laughs> um, so there's another bucket. I, I wanted to ask you how do you – see the daylight between those two buckets uh, where pragmatism is what works here but potentially doesn't work here? It's interesting you ask that because it's something that I've struggled with the most and it comes to that thing you're saying about people. Unfortunately, I, I would say I'm very optimistic about things despite my outward kind of demeanor at times. Like if you genuinely ask me what I think is going to happen in the world, I'm very optimistic about it. I'm not that optimistic about how much people change. Mm -hmm. And as you said, I think under stressful environments and whether it truly is stressful, but I think in general people perceive high-level sport as a stressful environment, I don't know that they will not revert back to those same behaviours. So I probably have a pessimism about how much they can improve. So I'm not necessarily willing to put in place interventions that I don't necessarily probably believe are going to change anything. Mm. Right. So it's probably a pessimistic view or it's a very pessimistic view of people's ability to adapt because I've seen some change and the thing that I'm very conscious of, and it's not to say that I won't work with people who I'm like, okay, it's when people have those very fixed kind of ideologies. Mm. And, you know, obviously you can get into, we spoke about Carol Dweck, um, you know, fixed mindset, growth mindset. If you can see that people have that idea of growth, if they've got certain views that you're like, I don't gel with it, that's cool. Mm -hmm. I really struggle personally if I see someone who's pretty fixed and you kind of you throw out a few suggestions. And as you said, I'm an antagonist. I, mm. I throw out a few things to antagonize people. And if they don't want to go back and forth a little bit, I'm like, nah. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't want to dance. They don't want to dance. Like, yeah. and to me, that's the whole fun of life mm. is throwing things out to people and seeing what they do. Like, mm. I have this habit of asking. The first thing I ask someone is like, what do you know? Right? I don't ask people how they are. Mm. Probably mean because I probably don't care. Right? Yeah, but it's also, it's, it's an A question, right? So in, in improv comedy, there's like A questions, B questions. Yeah, so that, this, that, what's this? Yeah. Well, the game is to get through the layers as quickly as possible yep. because the first one's always superficial. Yes. It's weather, you know, <laughs> and then you keep going down and, and then um, there's a, a Melbourne-based comedy outfit called Auntie Donna yep. and I heard them interviewed and they were basically one of the guys said the number one criteria he was dating at the time he was looking for uh, was someone who could go from A to D just – skip between layers of conversation, dialogue, understanding, intellect, and um, and play, yes. dance, dance. Yep. And, and I see that in you. And, look, 
before I throw your own podcast back to you, because <laughs> I, I, I appreciate you taking that question in the right spirit, mate, because um, juxtaposing those lenses or approaches is something that I see as a potential opportunity for you to yeah. enhance your coaching praxis, bringing people with you along the way. However, um, I didn't prompt you that I was going to ask you that, and you've answered it honestly and candidly. I don't know what the, like the, one of the things that, and this is me being open with listeners, but even with you, like one of the things that I think people perceive me because I'm very direct, that I'm not open. Mm. It's not the case. It's just that I have a very direct demeanor, and I'll. It's a trait that I have to work on because I reject things before I've even considered them, and then I usually come back and I've considered them. Like, oh, actually, yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah. But it's like this weird. I don't know if you, you ever watched the Marx Brothers. I have. One of my staff members, he, he pointed it out. And I, because like, I kept apologizing, because like, he would ask me something. I'm not. Nah. <laughs> and he's like, you haven't even considered it yet. I'm like, not. Nah. And he sent me this thing and it was Groucho Marx. And he's singing, I'm opposed. Then he's saying, you know, like, I don't care what you have to say. I'm opposed. I'm opposed. And, that, and that's me. And so I, I struggle with that because I, I don't know where that trait comes from yet. I haven't really worked that out but I'm becoming much more aware that I do it and I've got to always then go like, okay, let me, I've had the thing that I've started doing is saying like, let me think about that. Right. Right. That's right. been the first step. And I don't, it's not a, I don't think it's a great substitute yet. Yeah. Cause I'm sure they can still tell on my face. I'm like, I'm rejecting it. But well, I'm that's like, a just, cognitive behavioral therapy it uh, is, yeah. modality, right? Is you don't necessarily want to change the response, but just create distance between stimulus and response. Yeah. Think what you think later. Yes. Yeah. Give it, give, scroll, see the thing on Instagram that agitates you or whatever <laughs> yeah. and turn your phone over, wait five seconds, and pick it up and see if you still feel the same way. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, well done on uh, creating that space for yourself. Yeah, yeah. So when you ask, like, I don't feel any discomfort about you asking that and I'm not worried that, you know, it, it's something I'm like, okay, I'm aware that I sometimes will write people off. And mm. It's just like I'm done with that. I'm not, not interested. I need to keep working on it. I'm not uncomfortable about that because I don't, I don't know, you seem to be very much the same. I think one of the things that's really nice about coaching is you you have to evolve if you want to keep going up in mm. levels. And if you can't see that you're incomplete and you're flawed like everyone yeah. else and majorly in lot in some areas, then you're not going to get very far. So, you know, you asking me doesn't doesn't bother me in the slightest. Cause yeah, I, no, I, I appreciate I, that. Like we said before, you you either evolve uh, or you'd be with your to. will or <laughs> against your will. So, yeah. All right. I, I will ask you on the last question because I find that you're always up to something interesting. Is there anything that you're exploring at the moment in your professional practice or not that is taking some of your interest that you think, well, actually, is just taking your interest and, and something mm. that you're happy to share? Yeah, good question. There's, there's two things that I uh, am ruminating on on this one. One is completely out of my realm of expertise but well within my realm of curiosity, yeah. and that is AI yep. and how we could, better leverage uh, the human to AI interface. What are the thoughts that you're having that you feel like there's something there? Uh, and don't say porn. Uh, say again, sorry? Don't say porn. <laughs> <laughs> Too old, mate. Um, we're all in a world where dogma Exist. You alluded to the CNS example before, and throws is rife with a sim with similar dogma that goes unchallenged. Mm -hmm. And undoubtedly, we've we've got that, and we are not well placed by being central to it to see that from a third lens. But that's one of the great features of um, AI is that it just doesn't care. Yeah, it reminds and me. Of, you've seen the AlphaGo documentary? No. Okay, you'd like I'll it. I'll check it out. Essentially. For those who are listening, uh, AlphaGo is a, a documentary about the game Go and they yep. built an AI system to play against the best player in the world. And I think it's, it's move 37 or something. And the game, this AI system pulls this move that basically no, no one's ever seen. Whatever. Yeah, gotcha. And it just, it basically, the poor Grand Master is like the best player ever. Mm. It like scrambled his brain. Mm. The poor guy, he like didn't know what to do and he just like completely stuffed up the rest of that game mm. and then lost every game after that. and it was just like he was just fried because all of a sudden it was like he opened a window stepped through it or a door and it was like oh i'm not in kansas anymore like this is so different and that to me is so cool because it's like potentially those systems 
can do that where we're like, we were thinking about this like this and yeah. it's completely not that. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know go that well, but I, I don't study really chess and play chess and they're like, that's your Bobby Fishers of the yes. world who are borderline of that spectrum. acceptability. Um, they usually get rejected and spat out and they end up in asylums, you know, back in the day. But AI hey, can do that for us. It can point us, point it out to us the, the inconvenient truths, the what does that look like? I, I need, I would love to sit in a room with people smarter than you and I, certainly smarter than I, and, and, Definitely and is. With, a white, with a whiteboard and go through some of the problems that we can solve. And, and they're, they're already doing it at a, a macro level on much more worthy projects. Mm. Um, but from a, shel- a selfish perspective, I'd love to turn their, turn their gaze on some of the problems that you and I are, are, are energised by. Um, mm. th- there's one. The other one is uh, not completely distinct from, from what we just described is uh, how do we get small, open, directed teams um, that catalyze thought, challenge, and quote unquote professional development um, from within because we have a really healthy library of intellectual property. I would say, even if we look at the coaching community in this you're country, talking, you're talking this in, in track coaching, we're talking track track yeah. coaching, but it, it it could and should expand outside of that. You could easily go, you know, one more radius out from that or one more standard deviation out from that and and capture other professional sports or amateur sports or whatever it might be. Um, and how do we catalyze that to drive professional development in a communal way rather than a top-down way because there's an appetite for it. Yes. And once people reach a certain level, which I've been, I guess, yeah, you've been exposed thrown to. into yeah. and, and exposed to, it gets really hard to challenge externally unless you and then you seek it out yourself you know you know what i really want to catch up with john again because he made me think Mm. and how do i I think it's exactly that like uh it's a topic for off the podcast but i'll talk to you about it it's something you know i've been thinking a lot about excellence and what separates those people and one of the key things i think is very much just an environmental thing Mm. But I think there's people like you, you, you know, you're in these environments more than I am. But I mentioned this to someone this morning because we were talking about the same topic. I enjoy spending time with people like you because I walk away motivated. Mm. Because I'm like, he's thinking about things that I haven't thought about before. Or he's talking about a topic I don't know anything about. Mm. You know, like, I'm now going to go look up what you're saying, like, that com- the comedic structure of, like, a yeah, question. I'm going to go look right. that up because yeah, it's an improv structure. Yeah. An interesting thing is, it's like I don't know much about that at all, so I'm going to go look it up. Yeah, and as soon as someone like as soon as I get environments with people like that, I enjoy. And I think it's one of the things that pisses people off a lot about me, right? But I tend to do it because I feel like I'm seeking out play with people. I tend to ask a lot of direct questions of people, and and it's only been in the last few years I realized this. Because I'm looking for those people that will also do it back to me. Yeah. And often I write people off because I'm like, nah, they weren't interested. I'm going to dance. Yeah. I think one of the things that I've got to get better at is setting the example. Mm. And I think that's maybe one of the ways of like, if you go into those environments and you show people, I'm looking up this, like, what do you think of this? Prompting people in a very positive way, it drags it up in within from the center outwards. It's like Dale is pushing me to go and learn more because he's, you know, you're with the high jump coach and you're like, I was looking up the other day, like this stuff mm. about high jump. Have you considered this? And they're like, why the fuck is this bloke looking up high jump stuff? Can I help you tie a bow on this? Yeah, go. We use the term dance. You like people who dance, you dance. Yeah. You like, you, you're attracted to others who dance. Yeah. Why don't people dance? Why at grade six disco or at, you know, school form or whatever, it's, that's, that's, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Have you had thoughts on it? Well, I, like I have an initial couple of things. Predominantly, the one that pops up for me is it's usually self judgment, yes, self consciousness. That's, that's what pops up for me too. And fear. Yeah. And it's like they're scared to show they don't know something. That's right. Or that they're maybe not as aware of a topic. Or- they'll sing in the shower, they'll sing in the car, 
a dance where no one's watching, but it takes a, a cultivated level of security and courage to be able to dance in a communal setting. Do you, do you think that? Do you think that there is the ability to, if you demonstrate your willingness to be vulnerable, and I don't mean on an emotional level, but I mean like, you know, and I'm very conscious of it. Like, as I said, I know the perception people have of me is that I've got an, I've got an opinion on everything. But when I don't know something, I'm the first now to make sure that I say like, I don't know much about that. Mm. Like when you said, impro- like, I don't know anything about that. I'm going to go look it up because it sounds interesting to mm. me. Also check out the five whys. Okay, yeah, we'll one. do. Um, but I'm really interested, uh, like, by doing that, I hope that I help other people go, oh, John seems to know a lot, but he doesn't know anything about that. And he was really happy to say, I don't know anything about that. Do you think that that's helpful? Or do you think that some people still won't be willing to go, oh, I'm not willing to show that level of vulnerability? I think vulnerability is, uh, it's, it's not a switch. It's not no. something you can flick on and off. No, and, I agree. And meet people where they're at. And through increased shared experience, offering vulnerability, that's what I mean. It gets you reflected it. back. Yeah. Um, there are no rules to dancing. There is no, you know. Well, yeah. as I said, from the intellectual side of things, because I, I see this as you know a bit of an intellectual pursuit in a professional setting. Sure. I think showing intellectual vulnerability is really important, mm. right? Because to me, I think it's. And Carol Dweck talks about this stuff. Um, I really like the book. There was an evolution on some of that stuff by Joe Bowler. Have you seen any of Joe Bowler? Not, no. Yeah, you'd really like it. She actually is a mathematics teaching professor. Mm-hmm. So her research is on how do we teach mathematics better? And she's done work with Carol Dweck. But she talks in her book was really great. great. It's called Limitless Mind. Um, I actually enjoyed it more. It was, I thought it was written in a better way than, than Carol Dweck's book from an approachable point of view but basically both of them make the point of if you've got a so-called talented student you know who's studious and and academic in in nature if you say to them oh you're so smart they will protect that Mm. right and they won't take say intellectual risks Mm. if you encourage them by saying you've worked really hard at that or one of the things that they talk about as well is saying if they get all the que- answers right, say in a mathematics you know, little quiz, rather than saying, oh, you're so smart, look how quick you did this, you say, oh, I actually probably didn't pitch that at a high enough level for you. Next time I'll pitch it a little bit yeah, higher. nice language, nice language. Yeah, and it's, you know, these people are experts in education, so they understand what communicate. But it's that kind of stuff of like how do we really encourage intellectual vulnerability and even just the willingness to see ourselves as okay, I'm always on this journey of growth. Oh, and that that mastery cycle of learn the principle, apply the principle, dissolve the principle. Basically, in order to 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 get to the the dancing, you need to learn some steps. You mm. need to you need to learn to color within the lines. You need to get better at coloring mm. within the lines. And then usually, whether it's a, a musician by their or a band by their fourth album, they've got so tight what's gotten them popular that they get to a point where they just subvert it all and go, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do a country album. Yeah. And then the fans are like, what is this? Like, what is this? But they've done the, That's part of their mastery cycle is you can only color within the line so much. You can only reductionism only takes you so far and then freedom blows it open again. Mm-hmm. And certainly there, I do feel there's a, there's a current of appetite well, for to, if I, I, don't, I don't know, as I said, you're, you're in these realms a little bit more. I'm obviously more on the private side of things. But if I can be helpful in any way, then I'm happy to encourage it. Yeah, I know likewise, that, mate. You know, I feel like when people see, and I hope, you know, we'll try and share this with obviously some of our colleagues as well that work in the coaching. I feel like if they see people having these discussions, and they're probably being part of them, that they'd be happy to do it in more of their professional settings as mm. well. Because as you said, there is a vibrant community, but sometimes I think people are scared to kind of show that vulnerability of their knowledge or whatever it is probably a good time to put a full stop on that hey? thank you very much for your time mate i appreciate it you know taking time out of your day um if people want to reach out to you are you open to them uh, yeah, contacting I'm you on social pretty media average on social media um but uh, i'll i'll drop you my details and Perfect. we can go from there fantastic um thank you very much for listening please like and subscribe if you uh, have enjoyed this conversation